Hi, my name's, I'm not Rick Linklater. I'm also not uh, Eller Coltrane, although somebody pointed my hair and said, is that boyhood? Um, I, I think it's funny that somebody's calling Eller Coltrane boyhood now. I hope that doesn't stick. Um, but I want to, my name's Lars Nilsson. I program for Austin Film Society, and it's amazing to look out here. When this movie came out, Pope of Greenwich Village came out, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there, were, there was not an audience this big to watch it then. It's incredible that all these years later, and who do you ever hear talking about Pope of Greenwich? Nobody. You never hear anybody talking about this movie. Uh, and yet, everybody had such an amazing time last week, right? I mean, didn't we have an amazing time last week? That we're all here, for every single one of us here, I think I can speak for the whole crowd, is going to watch every single movie in this series. Even the one where the axe hits the lamp. We're even going to watch that movie, and we're going to like have the most amazing introductions that have ever been made for a movie, uh, and then we're going to talk about it afterwards. It really is, like for people who've been to film school, I think what you have when you go to film school is you get some jerk that talks to you about the movie, and then you watch the movies, and then some jerk talks to you some more about some movies, and you're like, okay, well, I just spent a lot of money on that. You guys came in here, and you spent like, I don't know, anywhere from five to like ten bucks and you're going to hear not some jerk. You're going to hear Richard Linklater, the great Richard Linklater, who's a man who like changed the face of like independent cinema, is going to tell you about this film. He's going to give you this introduction. Then you're going to watch a 35 millimeter print of this film that nobody is ever, ever going to show in a theater ever again, let's face it. <laughs> and then not only that, afterwards, we're going to sit here and you guys are going to get to ask questions, make points and everything. And you're going to talk about that with like this giant of the cinema. It's a, like an incredible thing that's happening that uh, Austin Film Society, its members, the people who sponsor Austin Film Society, and everybody has made happen. And you guys who are supporting Austin Film Society by being here are making this whole thing happen. So it's amazing. Uh, also making this happen is the Sundance, Sundance Now Doc Club, which you can sign up. I, I, I'm sorry, I have to look at my phone. I, I've, I really hate people who do this on stage. But I, I have to read this copy. Tonight, tonight's screen is sponsored by the Sundance Now Doc Club, a new streaming video service dedicated exclusively to documentaries. Check them out at docclub.com and try this service for 30 days for free. Okay, so I said that. All right, and do it. It's, I'm sure it's a great service. Um, so since this is the only screening that will happen within a approximate range of I guess maybe a thousand years of this film, <laughs> then you really can't talk during the show. So that means, you know, obviously you don't want to yell at like, you know, you wouldn't want like yell at Eric Roberts and say, oh, nice perm. <laughs> but you also, also try to avoid that whole thing where it's like, where like there'll be a sign and it'll say Canal Street and you turn to your friend and say, Canal Street. That's a baffling neurological dysfunction I don't understand, but don't do that also. And then also, uh, like all the phones and devices and everything, kind of as a long range thing, you can just take that whole thing and just set it to silent, all the, put it on vibrate and just leave it that way forever, which is a weird thing that I do. I know some people probably do that. But also, if you don't do that, you just turn it off during the course of the screening uh, or just silence it. And if you have an important call or if you have surgery or if the liver came in or whatever happened, <laughs> then you can run out to the lobby and tell them to wait. Okay, so, all right. I'm going to stop making jokes. I was just, I've been like a warm-up stand-up comedy setup here right now, I feel like. I'm going to stop making jokes, and I'm going to turn the mic over to a guy who we're so grateful to, AFS Artistic Director Richard Linklater. Thanks, Lars. You're a hard act to follow. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, no, it, I share that. I mean, it's so awesome to see so many people here. Um, I might have watched this film in this theater at the end. When did the Lincoln open? I don't know. Yeah, I missed it by a couple years. But uh, I was thinking of this title. I so look forward to seeing it for a number of reasons. But I was thinking the order that it's in is pretty interesting. You know, last week we were Stranger Than Paradise, the Lower East Side, the same year, 1984. So if you segue a couple, few blocks over, we're now in Little Italy with uh, Mickey Rourke and the great Eric Roberts. Um, <laughs> I want to, this whole series, I haven't, I'm not like a prof who, I didn't watch the DVD last night, so I have a lot of intelligent things to say before. I saw this film at the time, and I just want to watch it with you guys on a nice 35 print. Thank you, Lars, for tracking down the best print available. 
I have a little more faith that this film will be around more than a long time because I, re I remember really, really liking it. I mean, I was just getting into film a lot at that time, had seen these incredible performances by, you know, Mickey Rourke, if you see him in. He has that one great scene as the arsonist in Body Heat. He is so awesome in Diner, Rumblefish, and then here's his next movie. Eric Roberts, you know, you, if, at this time you might have seen him in, maybe or maybe not seen him in King of the Gypsies, uh, Raggedy Man, and then The Incredible Star 80 was the year before this. So you can imagine if you're, you're watching films, you know, at that time, how exciting it is. And then, you know, Daryl ha Hannah's in this too, and she was coming off Blade Runner. I think Splash was the same year, so she's hot. You know, I was like, wow. <laughs> you know, I'm talking from a young man's perspective. I was like, hmm, I'm seeing that movie. But I, I just remember being so excited to see this. And, you know, unlike the films the next two weeks, you know, Blue Velvet and Largent, the uh, axe hitting the uh, light uh, movie, th which are two just stone cold, unquestionable masterpieces, I think Popo Greenwich Village, I, that's why I really want to see it again. I'm, I'm really curious how it ages. I think it's kind of a tweener, and a lot of it is. What I mean is that in between maybe the studio films and the indie films, this was kind of a dying, I mean, this film is a character piece. I don't remember the plot much. There's some crime. There are these two small timers, uh, you know, I think uh, planning a robbery, whatever. It's about acting. It's about them. It's a character piece. And soon, you know, Hollywood was figuring it out. They were starting to quit make movies like this, you know. They didn't make much money. And the 70s was full of movies like this. So... I think what we're exploring in this series is a shifting, you know, Hollywood was, you know, last year we showed a lot of 80s movies that were saying, well, this is the last of the 70s movies. These, these are the, the end of something. And I think this is a good example. It's not the end of something. It's the end of it as a studio film. I think a film like this, even shortly thereafter, would be, a, you just have to do it on an indie level. This is a st big studio film. I think uh, a guy like Stuart Rosenberg, the director, you know, total... Um, you know, a wonderful director, long career, did such, you know, a, a bunch of really great movies. Right before this, he had done uh, Brubaker with Robert Redford, he had uh, Amityville Horror, I'm Working Backwards, Village of the Dam, Pocket Money, um, Cool Hand Luke, you know, is probably his most famous film. So he's he got a deft touch with comedy, he's good with crime, just a, a very, very good director. And so this is a studio film, and I think it was a kind of a dying breed, but I mean, we're really here for for Mickey Rourke and Eric Roberts, I feel, and let's just hang out with them. It, it was a certain kind of acting, we talked about this a little last week, that I think was kind of uh, maybe going out of style a little bit. I'll, I'll be curious to see how it holds up, but I just remember really being thrilled with these guys' performance and, uh, and the kind of movie it was. It's just like a, you know, two guys hanging out kind of movie and um <laughs> in, in their own way, there's a lot going on a lot of great supporting parts Geraldine Page can't think no you know I think Burt Young I don't know but like I said I don't remember a whole lot of it <laughs> except I liked it so anyway let's enjoy this and we'll be up uh, after uh, to talk about it so thanks for being here Thank yeah. you guys. that was <laughs> that was fun <laughs> yeah. a, lot of, a lot of hand gestures a lot of a lot of this did you notice yeah. this? <laughs> My thought. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, know, like some parallel universe, you got to think. Okay, if this film was not a box office success, <laughs> but uh, had it been, just let's just say in 1984, this was one of those surprise breakout hits, and Mickey Rourke and Eric Roberts become the Newman and Redford of their generation and make like five films together over the next 20 years. Wouldn't that, that's this parallel universe I want to live in. Yeah, that, that's a great like parallel and they're a great team. They're so good. They're it's so like, fucking good. And, and like Mickey Rourke immediately falls into like the Harvey Keitel and then, yeah, yeah, and they're, then Eric Roberts. They're the mean streets. streets. You know, yeah. The fuck up friend, cousin, usually some relative. Yeah. But they could have gone, they, they could have done it. They could have just said, hey, you know what? Let's switch. Like, like they could have switched to those two characters and Mickey Rourke could have played the fuck up. He could have. But like but he's but Eric so Roberts is so good, good at yeah, it. Yeah, they're both so perfect. I don't know. I just I, guys, what a great tip. Geraldine Page is so great. Yeah. She was nominated for an Oscar. So Geraldine Page plays uh, what's his name? Uh, Walter the she's cops. She's the mom. Mom. Who tells him she's only in a few scenes, but man, she's boom. You know what? A couple years later, trip to Bountiful. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, she wins the Oscar for me for that. And they call her the greatest actress in the English language. Wow. When she got that at that moment. Jeez. I mean, stage and screen. That yeah. whole part where she's like, my Walter was as tough as steel. Yeah. And he didn't get it from his father. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And I, I, I love this Kenneth McMillan, the guy who played the safe cracker. He's so good. Remember him in Dune? He's like Lord, one of the bad guys. He, he gives a number of really great performances yeah. through the series. And then he, he dies young. I mean, young. He wasn't 60. As I get older, that's good, Sean. But uh, he wasn't, yeah, I think he still had a lot to get. It was really sad. He, he gave such kind of beautifully nuanced performances in everything I ever saw him in. When you see like a stu any Stuart Rosenberg, like like Cool Hand Luke has a yeah. big ensemble cast. It's like an act he's an actor's director. Yeah. yeah, completely. That's what I was trying to say before. It's really about character and acting, and they really put you see where the emphasis is, where you know a film like this wouldn't make it. There's so much that would get cut out of like the Don Simpson Bruckheimer, and you know like okay that doesn't advance the story. Cut it. We wouldn't. Uh, I mean, Hollywood quit making stuff like this about right now for that reason probably. It's like you just hang around to say one funny line a minute later. You know, the way it just it, it takes its time, gives the actors all that space. I think it's beautiful, but, um, you know, that was slowly ending. You know, less, um, you know, much more plotty kind of movies. More formula. I mean, what's the formula here? I don't know. Like There's not much. It's just like these two guys on a thing. And, this thing well, assuming that it's, it's all there in the script. I haven't read the novel that's based on it. I read the script. Assuming yeah, yeah. It, like a lot of that's in the script, like yeah. it would have had to have gone through another cycle of notes and all that. And they yeah. would have trimmed a lot more stuff out. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's, I think it's a gem. It really is. That it just sort of snuck through, and you know, I think. God, what a beautiful print, too. It's yeah. just gorgeous. It really it's what, what, I, what I was saying earlier, like maybe a thousand years for this place again, it's not that it's not a really worthy movie, it's just that nobody yeah. talks about this. Nobody, there's no like rep series where they're playing this, except this one. Yeah, well, it deserves it. I mean, it's, it's just, I don't know, it's just, it's right in there. I mean, like I said, it's not, I don't know where it fits. It probably doesn't have, it doesn't take itself serious enough. It's not like The Godfather. It doesn't have the heft or the, the gravitas yeah. to, to be like an important film. It's, it has its goofy qualities to it, you know. But uh, that's what I like about it, though. I think that's the charm of it. It doesn't take itself. It got a so. lot. Of, it got a lot of laughs. Probably a few too many laughs, I'll say. But a, a lot of the laughs are built in. Like a lot of it really yeah, is meant to be funny. funny. Like yeah. I, I, Eric Roberts is a funny guy, and it's like his performance yeah. is. I mean, it's, it's, He's it's over the top. I think it's in character. You know, I think I remember this as a more over-the-top performances than it really is. I, I thought, kind of until the end, and I think they earned it, you know, the scene where he comes back, he's, Mickey Rourke's just beating the hell out of his apartment, which is a great scene. You know, Rourke's a boxer, right? He was a boxer young, and he quit acting for a while and went back to boxing years after this, even. And he really takes it out on that refrigerator. Yeah, the you know? poor refrigerator. Man, <laughs> man. and he can take a punch, too. Daryl Hannah's slapping the hell out of him, you know. But, uh, you know, when Eric Roberts comes in, and he's like, I love it when he go, hits the high point, and they're like, what the hell happened here? You know, he's looking around. <laughs> I, just, I, love it. I think they earn it. I think they earn their over-the-topness. He did get his thumb taken off. I mean, I don't know. That must have hurt, right? That scene with Tony Musante in front of the <laughs> fence is just like, oh, it, it, you feel like on the edge, like with the actor know, and his performance. Like, like you're, you're going so far out. I'm worried about you, you know? Oh, man, here comes Frank Vincent, you know, the guy you know, like in every score says it, like in Casino or, you know, it's Billy Bats, it's like, oh, that's the guy who's going to fucking kill you. You know, same guy. <laughs> Speaking of Scorsese, it feels, it, you know, yeah. it has that feel, except for the music. The music sucks. I'm sorry. The yeah, the music in this sucks. Well, they went with the Dave Grusin instrumental, you know, they went with this, that score. I don't know. Like, like that, that Irish about, the music when the cops are around. Move. What? Whenever the cops are around, it's like. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Not fair. Not fair. Diary of Q is epic. The Diary of Q, like, the score goes. It's just incredible. We're in the clouds of movies. It's incredible. They just fell in love and moved to Miami. Yeah, like, you know, <laughs> I think we've got an alternate reading of the film. Yeah. Right here. Yeah, there's something valid. They just spent a lot of time staring at each other. And, yeah, arm and arm. I mean, it's the, yeah. yeah it's More so than like Claude Rains and Humphrey Bogart yeah, at the end of Casablanca. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of bono me. Um, they're eating that giant sandwich together. Yeah. 
Uh, I do that with my friends all the time. <laughs> I wonder if we have any Italians. You know. <laughs> Oh, those the, the Rourke, those Irish, the Rourke, Italians, Robert, half, those Italians. They told him he's half, he's half Irish. What was he? He called them. You're, you're, you're half, you half Irish, Irish bastard or yeah, something. Yeah, half Irish. Kind of like Henry Hill and Goodfellas. Half Irish. There's a lot of half Irish. Those Italians and Irish, Irish. They take that shit serious. What? What percentage are you? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> when you work in New York, I was just. Uh, we were just talking about it. Like when you work in New York, like the all the drivers Italian, all the grips electric Irish. You know, it's just not, no exceptions. <laughs> no, sorry. Okay. Even still. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. So, like, there's not, like, Senegalese grips and stuff. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. It's an international city, but yeah. it's, it, it's stuck in its ways. Italian, yeah, yeah. I wonder if we have any contributions from the audience, any yeah. observations, any any questions or anything. It doesn't have to be, like, a question. We, we didn't make a movie. Uh, he already jumped in with the... Yeah, yeah, he jumped in with the comment over here. Anybody else got anything? Yeah, right over here. I thought it was awesome. I mean, Eric Roberts was over the top, but I thought it just was so true to his character. Yeah, they balanced just... each other great. He was like this reckless 13-year-old boy, <laughs> and Mickey Rourke was always trying to reel him in, but just kept yeah. getting taken by him over and over again, falling into the same thing and getting pulled down by him. I thought I thought it was super, and Eric Roberts was such. I mean, it was such great character acting. We watched Star Eighty yeah, last year. Star Eighty last year. Yeah, time. and I mean, just a completely different. That's a very different character. Such a different. If you ever have any doubt about yeah. that guy's acting ability, and his just, characters. Yeah. yeah. So so, awesome. Roberts is so is so great, and Rourke and Roberts both kind of, uh, you know, they both kind of hit a skid patch at the same time. <laughs> well, you know, actors. They both did gr excellent work throughout the rest of the, you know, I mean, let's, Roberts is in, what, Coca-Cola Kid, Runaway Train, there's more, you know, he, and Rourke gets even bigger, you know, nine and a half weeks, yeah. he's in a few hits. The, You're the Dragon. Yeah, You're the Dragon, Michael Cimino's film. Um, and the great Barfly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a few years after this, so. That's for like, like next year, Jules and the Wasteland next year, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, 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 we'll get to that section of the, yeah, <laughs> that would be great, but, um. Yeah, so, and, you know, those guys today, you see them in a movie, they still have a lot of presence. Yeah. And, you know, Robert uses work very interestingly, I think, and when they work together. And uh, Eric Roberts was just an inherent vice. Do you see that? He's, he's good, man. He's like the man, you know. So I think, I think, you know, again, these films that they're so good in weren't successful. That's what I, I'm thinking of tonight. It's like, had those been more successful, there would be more. You know, an actor can't really control their career. You know how mm -hmm. studio fuckers think they're like ah the public's rejected them as a leading man you know move on to another you know so you only get you, you're not in total control it's like you said like career no matter how great you are you know like they the, the, these movies began to be made again but but not in the studio system i mean they began to be made as like two million dollar movies yeah. if that yeah so i was saying before this film just really doesn't exist anymore mm -hmm. in, the, in that way so this movie went through different genres. It's like I felt like I saw every genre in this movie. It's like comedy, and now it's like oh, it's it's a fucking gangster movie, and now it's this, and like everyone acted well in those genres, but at the same time, as a coalescent piece, it didn't yeah. come together. That's why I laughed a lot. I think it holds it together. Yeah. I'm, I'm, but like the music too. It's like John Carpenter's like. Cue, cue the, like, now it's time to cry. Now it's time to be scared. And it's like, do do do, whatever music's happening, that's how we're supposed to feel. <laughs> okay, we're down on the score tonight. All right, so if Dave, Dave Rosen it. can't defend himself, you know, I took a yeah. shot, you took a shot. Okay, that's that's, that's enough for Dave Rosen. <laughs> we'll give him a break. Right, right back oh, here. Man. of all time with no um it does seem abrupt he's giving the guy lie that's not gonna and they just walk off very slowly like nothing happened like lie that'll fucking kill you right is he is he dying in the street or whatever it's like one of those it's like lie one of those, will kill you is it 
Yeah, oh no, it's not good. What, you can't. What about no. all the henchmen around him with the they're not I love those New York those little members only clubs and you know the atmosphere. It's when you could just walk you out. You got one you shot, can. you run, take off, get out of here, and they're just like, hey, da 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 talking shit. <laughs> like, Window hey. shopping. <laughs> It's it's like the ending of like Atlantic City. It, it, yeah. it, it kind of goes into this sort of dream like yeah we got away with it. What do you want? To feel yeah between Cutter's Way and Atlantic yeah. City from last time, it just feels like it's of that. What's but, that genre? But I, I think know. we'll all take it, you know. And and that's the difference oh, between right. if it had been like a 1972 movie, they would have died horribly. Oh yeah, much more grim. <laughs> right. Much more. I mean, there things aren't going to get much easier. I like it. It's like well, except for. You know, her leaving in your thumb, well, things are looking pretty good. It's like, things are shitty for you guys. Things are bad. Let's admit it. <laughs> and let's not act like this kind of stuff isn't going to happen again yeah, like, it's in a month. Happen tomorrow. I mean, they're coming for him. They know he was in it. I mean, no, these guys are screwed. But <laughs> Character is destiny, as Richard Nixon said. I wonder if we have any other... Uh, yeah, in the back in the red shirt there. So is he going into satire within the genre of like Italian yeah, crime? Like, and, and it's you know it's you're sort of on edge at some points, but then he like throws something in where it's just it's making fun. I think a lot about point of view. I think that's actually like Paulie's and Charlie's kind of point of view of the world. There, there's this kind of goofy quality, Polly, that but it gets really serious fast when they're about to you know when someone dies or someone's you know. I'm gonna cut off your thumb, but other than that, he's right back to. So I think that's kind of the point of view of the movie. It can get really serious, and then it can be kind of like, well, what the fuck? Yeah, exactly. You know that aerobic scene, isn't that? That's like the only time you really feel like you're in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. You know, other than that, it has this kind of beautiful ambiguity to it. That's yeah, it could awesome. be any time. I was like, okay, now we're in the 80s for sure. Yeah. Other than that, it just kind of looked. That almost kind of has that feel of like yeah, some it. somebody who put money into the movie was like. Yeah, but I gotta have this. Yeah, <laughs> we gotta have one work right. Scene. <laughs> <laughs> but this, what, what, one, I think one serious thing because we talk about like, you know, oh, so the director was probably doing this. The director's probably doing that. I think in a movie like this where you have two actors who are just going off, it, it calls into question like, who's the auteur of this film? Like, is it Rosenberg? Is it kind of the because Rosenberg being in such an actor's director is kind of saying to the actors. You go nuts, I'll reel you in if you go too far, sort of. So it, aren't they kind of the auteurs in a way? It, it feels very like rehearsed, and I think they just put a lot of thought into yeah. the, every little bit of the performances. I don't know the history of the movie. I don't know if they rehearsed for weeks. I don't know any of that. But it, it just it feels like it is. But that, to me, that's a very director-driven. It, you know, any movie, you just let the actors go out. It, it's usually a mess. Is it like, like, so, so like... <laughs> You're, with inspired you're kind things, of known well, you, that, you are known but, as an actor's director like so like you're you're directing <laughs> you're directing this movie <laughs> like like how how That's are you kind of how are you working great. with them That's how what are you doing great. whatever it takes you know i mean those guys are so talented i think you you're yeah you're letting them go but then kind of just catching catching a group with who they are and just reminding them, you know, their characters and stuff. Like, did Polly really do that? It's like, yeah, okay. Does an actress director kind of have to sublimate some of that ego, some of that thought that, like, this is my film, you know, in order to work yeah, with this a film like this? You go, you live and die with those performances. Yeah. You know, so yeah, you, in that regard, you want the actors to think it's it is their movie. Mm -hmm. There's no way those guys didn't think <laughs> that was their movie, and it is. Yeah, so some of that they're sense the of, of point of view of the characters, I think yeah. a lot of it comes from the the performers because they're making the movie, and it's like yeah. they're the, the great actors like that are on the side of their characters so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, making, sometimes the director's job is really just to to kind of keep just kind of keep steering the ship a little bit, reminding them, and you know, we're just, it can vary wildly, movie to movie, character to character, beat to beat. Who knows? But ah. Uh, just a great cast. Just nice. Um, right over here, yeah. Yeah, Daryl Hannah kind of acted in it. You know, 
Jim Rose is very good. Does that mean you don't think she's a good actress in other things? She's a great model. She was a great model. In what? In what? I think they're great. What are you talking about? When you see like a Brooke Shields performance or something, like you, you like yeah, okay, that's. But the, this is Daryl Hannah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. She's wonderful. Yeah, no, I think there's a big difference. Like, like she's she great. Natural, you know. Yeah, she's good. Give her a break, man. Yeah, give her a break. Hey, we're, we're team Daryl here all the way. It's Daryl's night. We, we love Daryl. She's great. She, she, her name's Daryl. You know. I know. She's so good. She's been through a lot. Good. In the back, right back here. She cares. And so it's a time. It's people laugh about it. It's it's true though. It's true. It's you know that's why you see this in in a lot of like as subjects and stories. I think. Yeah, it's it's different. It's kind of it's. I mean, it's gone for. I mean, a lot of people mm -hmm. who don't have that sense of family anymore. Yeah. Like with Italians, when you would stick together and and be in one neighborhood, it was a really sense of family. Well, I think Mean Streets is one of the archetypes of yeah, that. Like, absolutely. why are you hanging out with this fuck up who's making your life tough? And uh, <clears throat> to drop a name, I was hosted a screening of Mean Streets in New York once at the Directors Guild, and I sat here with Scorsese, and, and I asked him that. I said, "Well, that's one of the criticisms that I went back and read some reviews, and some people said." Some of the mainstream critics said, like, they, don't, they didn't believe the relationship mm -hmm. between Charlie and Johnny Boy. He was like, um, why would he hang out in, in Scorsese? He just goes, ah, Americans, they don't get it. Americans. <laughs> <laughs> As if he was. <laughs> and he t said that it was really, that relationship was based on his own father and uncle. To, on his father's deathbed, he was still writing like a $35 check to his fuck up brother. <laughs> like that went their whole life. He did that, you know, 20 years before those guys were gone. You know what I mean? It was that kind of brother or uncle, you know, the weird cousin. It's just family first, you know. So I don't think, yeah, blood. It's real. I think uh, it's hard to think of two movies that are m any more different than the movie that we're doing this week and the movie we're doing next week. And I'll just make a sort of procedural note here to note that next next Wednesday you'll be gone, but we added a show the Sunday after, so yeah. your pass is good for either show. You can come to the one where I guess you and I are going to try to film some something. I hope we remember to do that. Oh right, <laughs> film an intro. intro, and then uh, and then on see Blue Velvet, on and then on Sunday the you'll be screen. here, yeah, and we'll yeah, do I this whole thing. But yeah. Blue Velvet is very different. The style of film, it's kind of a diorama. Yeah, film. it's kind of timeless too. I mean that's. Its own retro look and stuff, but that's just standalone, all-time masterpiece. I think it's hard to say it's David Lynch's masterpiece. He's made so many great films, but I mean, I think most people would rate it, you know, way up there. That was the first yeah. one when you really kind of got, to, really got to Lynch land, sort of fully complete. I mean, you, you, Eraserhead is like a dream. It's like a nightmare. Yeah. But so is Blue Velvet, though, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It a, yeah, but, it, but it's more of like Eraserhead. It's you look fully at it, there's, realized. There's nothing in, that you're identifying with. It's in with. this world. Right. Yeah. You're identifying with Eraserhead. This, this, now you're scaring me. <laughs> <laughs> I love Eraserhead. Me too. Yeah, I love David Lynch. But there's no, but, uh, there's no point of identification. Yeah, no, you're yeah. right. You're right. But no. Um, yeah, Blue Velvet. Whew. What a great Dennis Hopper performance. And just everybody, oh, can't wait to see it. And, and that's, uh, we, we'll talk about mm -hmm. the way that David Lynch directs, which is very different, and the kind, the kind of movie that he's looking to have. Like, David Lynch is obviously right on top. I, I, I'm curious to know the way that David Lynch would, like, direct actors. Hmm. Like, how much he's letting them go, and how much he's, like, line reading them. I think he's on them. Yeah. Yeah, I've talked to some actors who work with him. Where he's like, like you he got to do it this way. He has real specific ideas. Yeah, right, right. Supposedly, you know, Frank Booth, you know, Hopper's character, he came in and said, I want to make him kind of, you know, sinister and more subtle. And Lynch was like, no, I want him <laughs> big. Yeah. No, you're going that direction. You know? Usually it's the other way around. An actor going too big and a director saying, no. You know. 
Hoffett. So with Hoffett. with a movie like this, you get the feeling like that they sh- that you know they had an idea, they rehearsed and they had an idea what was going to happen, and then like a bunch of magic happened because like oh oh Eric Eric came up with this new thing during you know the first take and we had to use it and stuff like that. With Blue Velvet, you get a feeling like Lynch has the whole movie in his head, kind of Hitchcock like. Feels that way. And he's like he's a painter or something. Exactly. Like yeah, it's yeah. pretty. It's very precise. But that said, the performances are so they're, they're really out there. You know, I love and Kyle and Laura Dern. It's such a wonderful, beautiful. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of movies in one. You know. Yeah, it really but is. All, and where he was at, it's kind of indicative. The '80s masterpieces just sort of happen after the failure or perceived failure. You know, Dune was kind of a down point for him, I think, in a lot of ways. And it was just such a comeback, you know, such a crazy, uh, you know. Like I said a lot last year that the 80s wasn't really kind to so many of the mm-hmm. kind of the best directors. It was a really tough time to get good films made. But uh, it was kind of the one of the great uh, rebounds of all time. And it kind of a, he snuck that one in there. I think he, Made a deal with Dino De Laurentiis exactly, or something yeah. on Dune, like, "Hey, do my next film." It's like, "Okay, if you'll do that," you know, it was one for them, one for him. Yeah, it was a weird time in that you had, um, you had a maverick, like a you know a billionaire yeah. type maverick, like Dino De Laurentiis, and you had these weird companies that were still kind of kicking around. Yeah, they could they could do something like that, whereas like you couldn't see, you know, you couldn't see Sony, you know, no, taking no a chance studio, or anything like that. Never, never. That's why, it, it, yeah, it's it's. I see it as kind of timeless, like that should never have been made. <laughs> and yet, there you were sitting at the mall watching yeah. Blue Velvet. It was fucking incredible. Literally in the mall. For yeah. people who don't realize, yeah, no, literally I, Blue Velvet was... Played in malls. And it was kind of a sensation. I don't know if they made yeah. a lot of money, but it was on the, you know, people were talking about it, you know? And it was in the mall. Yeah, no, it was it was crazy. Yeah, I can't explain it. it was so, so that's wild. next but week. Yeah, don't miss that. And if you miss that, you're out of your mind. We have yeah, really, one last contribution over here. Yes. Yeah, no, I, you know, I'm with you. I mean, it was just like, they were working with us, trying to please us. <laughs> you know, it was, I just think it was really, um, it was very innocent in a way, for be, and for being, you know, extremely sophisticated as well. So I just, I want to say nice things about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, I, to, this was delightful. That film, I, we talked about it last week. I'm not so sure. You know, I was kind of curious, like, this one, and I, I come out like, this film is, I think it's aged really well. I think it's, Wonderful. I mean, there's just so much. And there's so great many, yeah, stuff. so many great it things. Really I don't think we were trash in the movie. I think uh, Dave Bruzen got some rough treatment for his score, but that's. <laughs> that never, and I'll be honest, that never bothered me before. Yeah, yeah. A beautiful I, use. Sinatra. Sinatra wins it. He opens it. He closes it. How can you say anything bad about? Yeah. It's great. <laughs> That's a great so scene. So many great moments, so many great scenes, and yeah, no, it's a, it's 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 wonderful. It could have in an alternate universe, it was a big hit. I'm no, just talking about that. Been, and, and they, <laughs> let's have one last contribution because I, I, you know, we've we've uh, we've been on this for about forty minutes. So let's uh, let's talk to you right over here. This was, a, this was a great night. It was a great print, very special, and I just want to thank all of you. This was so great to watch this with everybody here tonight. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you, Rick. And thank See you, Dave you Grusin. <laughs> Grusin. <laughs> you did good. Uh, our, our next series is called Grusin for a Bruisin. It will be the best scores by Dave Grusin. Thank you very much. <laughs>